The answer is it's both, right? It depends on how we use it. Uh, technology is both a tool for oppression and a tool for liberation. Technology is increasingly the means we use today. Uh, it's, it's the method by which we apply science uh, and mathematics and technology. Uh, it's the science of applying progress to guaranteeing human rights to our generation and the next. We talk, for example, uh, about censorship in, in other countries around the world uh, where internet connections are being blocked. We use tools like encryption to allow people to connect to sites without the means of transmission, right? Your internet service provider, your AT&T, your Verizon, to be able to sort through what you're looking at. Uh, instead, they see you're making a connection to a website, the New York Times.com, but they can't see what actual article is going there. So now they have to engage in site-level blocking as opposed to page-level blocking. Uh, and this might not be a right that's guaranteed in this country or that country. But increasingly, technology is providing us means to guarantee rights beyond beyond jurisdictions. We can secure human rights through the systems that surround us every day, that we rely upon invisibly, that are sort of pervasively around us, saturating us with networks or whatever, uh, that can actually amplify the level of dignity that every life enjoys. Now, that can also be subverted for very purposes, for ends. This is the story of mass surveillance, where for example, uh, AT&T, uh, there was a story recently in the New York Times, uh, and the Associated Press of Reuters, I believe, uh, that revealed AT&T had invited government officials into their space, because uh, these are salary government employees working at AT&T facilities, who had access to 23 years of calling records about them. This isn't, you know, uh, 12 months, 18 months, whatever. This isn't for sort of a targeted investigation. These are all the records that AT&T had ever collected and stored in sort of a digital format since they began collecting these records. For some people, 23 years is longer than the span of their entire life. Talk about your four and a half year old sons. You don't just have to tell them about what they're doing on social media. You have to tell them about what they're doing anywhere where it leads a transaction. Anywhere it creates what's called metadata, which is sort of the pollution of our digital activities. Uh, you know, when you swipe a part of the bus, uh, when your phone passes a cell phone tower, records are being created and stored, and again, they can be used against you. And so the, when we apply that to the context of your broader argument, which is that more data is being generated, does this necessarily mean we won't have privacy anymore? History provides kind of an interesting way of looking at this. Uh, one of the former Supreme Court justices of the United States, uh, Brandeis, uh, at the beginning of the last century, he was on the Supreme Court, but before that, actually in 1890, he wrote an article for the Harvard Law Review about privacy and about the increasing threats that it faced uh, from gossip and tabloids and broadsheets because printing was becoming very uh, cheap. And they were going after reputations and some private controversies that weren't really of public interest. And he argued that it was not about serving the public interest, it was about serving a trade. They were making money off the publication of private details about private activities and private lives. And so they tried to define what privacy was, is it going away, is there any sort of legal right to it. And this eventually became the doctrine of the United States, uh, at least in the courts to some degree, where later on the Supreme Court it was described that privacy is the right to be left alone. Privacy is really what we used to describe as liberty. It is the protection that describes the domain of our intellect and our emotions. You know, we talk about things like freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and of course these are critical freedoms, but the, the underlying font from which the things that we write, the things that we share, the things that we speak come from is ourselves. It's from our thinking. Uh, it's from our sharing, it's from our emotions. It's this selective sharing that allows us to decide who we are and who we want to become. And if we lose that, if we say there is no privacy or we shouldn't care about privacy uh, because more data is being generated, we put ourselves in a place where we are afraid to speak because we are afraid to be prejudged 
before we have developed our words. Will you share an utterance with a friend in a private space if there is a private space? And increasingly, sort of checkpoints that we used to be from uh, the instruments of state, whether these were you know, a police checkpoint, a border checkpoint, or whatever, uh, where they check your papers, they see who you're communicating with, uh, the post office might look at the extra outside of your envelope to see who you're communicating with. Uh, increasingly, these are reaching within the walls of our homes, where, for example, our partners uh, in Britain, Britain's NSA, uh, they were using the webcam 